we published a paper where we took 11 women with type 2 diabetes and had them adopt a low carbohydrate diet for 90 days. And after just 90 days, the insulin resistance was gone. There was no evidence of type 2 diabetes at all. And so they never had to take any medications. Hey guys, today our guest is Dr. Benjamin Bickman. Dr. Ben Bickman is among the world's foremost scientists on metabolic health and insulin resistance. Dr. Bickman has a PhD in bioenergetics and a postdoctoral fellowship with the Duke National University of Singapore in metabolic disorders. He currently explores the contrasting roles of insulin and ketones as key drivers of metabolic function. He's also the author of the book, Why We Get Sick, which is a must read. Ben frequently publishes his research in peer reviewed journals, presents at science meetings and is internationally recognized as a leading scientist based on his expertise in insulin resistance and metabolic disorders. I'm very happy to invite Dr. Ben Bickman to the show. Thanks Ben for coming to the show. Thank you so much for the invitation. You and I were discussing how important this message is for people in India and I am delighted to share any insight I can. Thank you so much, Ben. Ben, before we go into the interview, can you share where can people connect with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm fairly active on social media. Mostly that is Instagram. And I typically will just create short little videos about human metabolic function, usually about fat cells, because that's what I know so much about. But people can find me at Ben Bickman, PhD. Thank you so much, Ben. Ben, my first question is, can you explain what is insulin resistance to the general audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so first of all, I'll even go one step further back and just making sure everyone is familiar with the hormone insulin itself. Insulin is a hormone that we're making from our pancreas all the time unless a person is a type 1 diabetic. In the case of type 1 diabetes, they don't make insulin. But for all the rest of us, we have insulin flowing through our, bud, our blood all the time. And the main, the main action of insulin is to control blood glucose. When we eat a starchy, sugary meal, blood glucose starts to go up. If it stays up for too long, that's dangerous. So insulin comes up and it helps the glucose come back down by, by pushing the glucose into different cells and out of the blood. So that's, that's insulin's main action. However, insulin has an action at every cell in the body. That's so important to understand why insulin resistance matters so much because every single cell can respond to insulin. And insulin will tell every cell to do something and it will be something different at each cell. Now, in insulin resistance, it's really two problems happening at the same time and they will always happen together. The first one is that some of the cells of the body aren't responding to insulin as well as they did before. So the insulin's ability to, to, to do something at the cell has been compromised or the cell is resistant. And so that is the insulin resistance part of what we call insulin resistance. But this is really a problem that is like a coin and there's two sides to this coin that we call insulin resistance. I just described one of them. The other side of this coin is that blood insulin levels are chronically higher than they used to be. So every moment of the day, sleeping or awake, insulin is elevated much higher than what it used to be. And so we have those two events. One, insulin isn't working the same way it used to at certain cells of the body. And two, blood insulin levels are higher than normal. This is a condition called hyperinsulinemia. And when we talk about insulin resistance in a body, in a person, those two come together. And in fact, that last point is very relevant, the elevated insulin. The average person in India has fasting insulin levels that are almost twice as high as the average person in the United States. That is a very big problem and that is why India needs to hear what you and I are talking about right now. Thank you so much Ben. Ben, how did you feel back then when you found that uh, primary research do not support dietary guidelines and medical recommendations? Yes, so I do think that the reason insulin resistance has become the single most common problem in the United States and in India and in many other countries around the world is because we have been too good at doing what we're told. And that sounds silly, 
But the dietary guidelines that are so pervasive around the world now encourage us to eat often. They will say eat smaller meals and eat three times uh, every three hours or six times a day or something. And they will tell us to eat most of our calories from carbohydrates and relatively few calories from fat. And unfortunately, the fat that they do encourage us to eat is the worst kind of fat. It's fat from these industrial seeds like soybean oil and corn oil. So the big problem is that the bulk of our calories because we've been told to do this comes from carbohydrates and carbohydrates are the macronutrient that spikes insulin the most and so when we have a diet that is that is consisting largely of, of grains like bread or naan or rice then then and then we are cereals then our insulin is going to be spiked dramatically and, and and then by the time insulin starts to come down we've we eat another starchy sugary snack and it comes up again and up again and so a person is spending every moment of the day with insulin several times higher than it should be or than it wants to be so the dietary guidelines are are truly working against us when it comes to uh, improving our metabolic health thank you ben ben how to deal with anti low carb diet people despite having evidence yes so it is a very delicate topic to to talk about diet and to try to tell people what they should eat now I, i'm not going to do that i don't like telling people what they should eat what i try to do is come to the discussion focused on insulin and i talk to people about how important insulin is for Im, uh, improving body fat and i tell them that if you want to shrink your fat cells you can only shrink your fat cells if insulin is low it's impossible to shrink fat cells if insulin is high because insulin will tell the fat cell to stay big or be bigger i will also talk about how insulin chronically elevated insulin and insulin resistance is a fundamental cause of alzheimer's disease and people are very afraid of alzheimer's disease in fact my lab is just about to publish a manuscript where we have found different gene expressions in human brains of people with alzheimer's disease or not and the people with alzheimer's disease have problems with with glucose and insulin so and heart disease the the leading cause of death in the united states and i think it's the same in india it is almost totally a problem of insulin resistance changing changing blood pressure and and atherosclerosis so i i always try to impress upon someone how important it is to keep insulin levels low and then once they can nod their head and agree with me that it is important to control insulin then i say well there is one better way to control insulin than any other and that is by i like to say there's three rules you control carbohydrates now i that i'm not saying don't eat any you know, that's very polarizing and some people don't want to hear that but i say control carbohydrates focus on fruits and vegetables eat them don't drink them though eat them god wanted us to eat fruits and vegetables not drink them and and be very careful with grains um those will spike insulin significantly so that's what i mean by control carbohydrates and then prioritize protein make sure you get a lot of good protein and that always that has to come from animals if a person is trying to get their protein from plants it will not be as good for them and the third principle kind of goes with number 2 which is don't fear fat fat is a wonderful macronutrient that on its own will not spike insulin but fat and protein in nature always come together the best proteins come with fat and we should eat it, eat them that way don't try to get rid of that fat fat and protein are supposed to come together and when fat comes with protein it helps the protein work better you will actually build muscle better when you have fat with your protein than protein alone and that's another problem with plant proteins not only are they artificial but they don't come with fat that's not the way the human body is built we are supposed to eat our fat with protein and it helps us digest the protein better so my my idea with controlling carbohydrates really is it's not because i i hate carbohydrates or i'm afraid of carbohydrates it is simply that as a scientist i study 
the consequences of chronically elevated insulin, and I, I have a, an utter conviction that the key to a long, lean, healthy life is to keep insulin low. And the easiest way to do that is those three principles, control carbohydrates, prioritize protein, and don't fear fat. Thank you so much, Ben. Ben, is glucose intolerance same as insulin resistance? A lot of great question. Um, <clears throat> no, no. It can be um, one, you can use the term glucose intolerance to describe someone who does have insulin resistance, but you can also have it separate where you have someone who has adopted a low carbohydrate diet for a long period of time, they are very insulin sensitive. Their, their insulin levels are very low. And if, if I were to uh, take a person who was on a low carbohydrate diet and give them an injection of insulin, their glucose levels would go very low very quickly. In other words, they're very insulin sensitive. However, if we were to take that same person and have them eat 100 grams of pure carbohydrate. They eat a big naan. Um, and, and we see that now, after following a low carbohydrate diet for six months, their glucose levels will actually go higher and take longer to come back down than it would have before we did it, assuming that they didn't have insulin resistance, of course, because then that keeps it higher longer anyway. So some people will look at that phenomenon and they will say, ah, well, now when I eat carbohydrate, my glucose goes higher than what it did before, so I'm now insulin resistant. That can happen with insulin resistance, but that is not what's happening here. With adherence to a low carbohydrate diet, it's almost as if the body has just turned off glucose burning. We talk about this concept of metabolic flexibility, and it is that the, uh, a healthy person, a, a metabolically flexible person, they will eat a meal and they will go into sugar burning mode right after that meal. And then once they've burned through that glucose from that meal, then glucose burning turns off and they go into fat burning, which is what should be happening during a fast. However, the average person, because their insulin is chronically elevated, they eat their meal and they're in sugar burning mode. And then even after their meal, hours later, they're still in sugar burning mode because insulin dictates which fuel we use. If insulin is up, the body's burning sugar. If insulin's down, the body's burning fat. Now, in contrast, with a low carbohydrate diet, the body has been eating so little carbohydrate and has insulin levels that are so low that the body basically becomes metabolically inflexible in the opposite direction that the body has turned off sugar burning because it doesn't need to burn it. It's only burning fat, well, mostly burning fat. And so it's almost as if the body gets stuck in fat burning. Now, I don't think that's a problem, but it might be a problem if a person is regularly in, uh, eating carbohydrates. So if you have a person who is adhering to a very low carbohydrate diet or fasting for two days, that is a wonderful way to get into fat burning mode because insulin comes down. But then if they eat a meal at the end of their fast that is built totally on carbohydrates, that's not good because now you're pushing the body back into this sugar burning state that it had been kind of turning off. And what I think is at the heart of the glucose intolerance that comes from a low carbohydrate diet is that the pancreas has two ways of releasing insulin. It has what's called a first phase and a second phase. When we eat, if you and I were to sit down and eat some rice and, and naan, and I keep saying naan because I love garlic naan more than almost anything in the world, so I always obsess over it a little bit. But if we ate this, we would see our insulin levels would kind of have this a, a small peak and then a bigger peak. That first small peak is the result of the pancreas already having some insulin made and ready to go. It's just the insulin is sitting there and the pancreas, when it gets the message, it just dumps that insulin out. And then the second phase is the new insulin the pancreas is making. Now we are doing some studies in my lab right now, but what I hypothesize is that the pancreas stops making those preformed insulin. It stops, so it doesn't have that first phase. And so what happens is it takes a little longer because the pancreas is thinking, well, why should I keep all of this ready-made insulin around when I'm never using it? 
So I'm just not going to keep as much around. And so what I think happens with a low carbohydrate diet long term is that what used to be a big first phase and then a bigger second phase is a very small first phase and then a normal big second phase because the pancreas can still make insulin. It's just kind of turned that off but can turn it back on, but it takes a little while for the metabolic, for the enzymes, for the machinery in the pancreas to get back up to full production. Thank you so much, Ben, for clearly explaining. Ben, can you explain what is insulin to glucagon ratio for an average person? Yes, yes. So uh, you've done your homework uh, here with stuff I've spoken about before. So insulin is a hormone that uh, its signal to the body when, it, when insulin comes to the cells of the body, it tells the body, the, the cells, to store energy. So insulin wants, for example, insulin wants fat cells to get bigger and store more fat. Insulin wants the liver to, to, to make and store fat as well. And for example, not to burn fat, which the liver has to do when it wants to create these molecules called ketones. When the liver's burning a lot of fat, it's making ketones from that fat burning. So insulin wants to turn that off and it wants the body to store fat, not burn fat. Glucagon is an opposite in a way where it wants the body to use energy. It wants the body to burn fat. It wants the, the fat cells to let the fat go. It wants the liver to burn more fat and make ketones from that fat. And so when we look at something like, say, dietary protein, in fact, let me go back up. So when we look at carbohydrate, when someone eats carbohydrate, um, oh, and of course, the biggest difference between insulin and glucagon is what they do to blood insulin levels. Whereas insulin wants to push glucose levels down, glucagon wants to push glucose levels up. And so they each are very important, and, and they kind of have this intricate dance that they, they engage in. Now, when someone eats carbohydrate, glucagon gets turned off. Insulin gets turned on. When someone eats dietary fat, it's kind of the opposite. There's no insulin release, and there's a bigger glucagon release. And what's so interesting is when someone eats protein, protein does have an insulin effect. That's like meat. Someone, like for example, that's a perfect example, but any protein would work. Um, if someone is eating that protein and they're not eating it with carbohydrate, which in nature happens very often, the best proteins do not come with carbohydrate. And so I don't think we should mix the two. But if someone eats protein without carbohydrate, they do have an insulin effect, but they also have a glucagon effect. And so the insulin to glucagon ratio, the balance of these two hormones, one for example, trying to tell fat cells to get bigger, the other trying to tell fat cells to shrink, they end up kind of canceling each other out or balancing each other out. And so some people, some people that adhere to a low carbohydrate diet or even a ketogenic diet, they will say, don't eat much protein because protein will increase your insulin and then that will stop ketone production. But my counter to that is you should eat protein, never be afraid of protein, and don't be afraid of the insulin effect because it's matched by a glucagon effect, which will tend to offset some of the effects of the elevated insulin. That's awesome, Ben. Ben, my next question is, can you explain the difference between nutritional fast and caloric fast? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so we mentioned fasting a little earlier. In fact, I would even add fasting as one of my rules. I'd mentioned the three macronutrients with carbohydrates, protein, and fat. I have another one, that, which is fast. It's okay to, to fast. It's okay to not eat all the time. And the, the, the power of fasting is that it, it's the perfect way to just lower insulin. And if you have excess body fat that you want to use, well, now you're using your own energy for fuel. Too often, people they forget what fat is for and that fat that we can pinch and we can jiggle and we're embarrassed of that is basically like the body has energy bars or energy drinks all over it just waiting to be used but we cannot use it until insulin is down so that is one of the main benefits of a fast it helps insulin come down very very well so there's two ways to do that one is a true fast where you aren't eating or drinking any calories so you're not drinking juice, which no one should ever drink, but you're not even drinking milk. Um, you're not eating any foods. You have no calories coming in. You're just drinking something like water. That's a caloric fast, as I call it, 
I like to call it a caloric fast because you're not taking any energy into the body. However, I do think there's another aspect where we can kind of leverage or get some of the benefit of fasting, which is insulin staying low for a longer period of time. And that is a nutritional fast, which is when you simply basically follow those rules that I mentioned, where you are cutting your carbohydrates down to very, very low levels. And because carbohydrates are the main stimulator of insulin, you're keeping insulin low, even though you're eating some protein and fat. So that is like it, like an egg, you know, which I think is a perfect balance of protein to fat. You're eating an egg and your insulin is going to do maybe nothing at all. Or if it does, then it's a very, very small little bump. And so it's, it's like you're getting some of the benefits, many of the benefits of fasting, but you don't have to um, not be eating anything. You don't have to be hungry. So you can eat and, and you're still getting some of the benefits of the fast. Thank you so much, Ben. Ben, what do you say to the people who say that uh, eating many eggs will raise TMAO and it causes diabetes? Yes. So there was a study published not long ago from, from uh, out of China, and it got a lot of headlines. Always, always, anytime there's any evidence that suggests any animal foods are bad, they always get the headlines. If there's any evidence that suggests animal foods are good, no headlines. No one wants to know. Uh, and I think that's people should wonder why that happens i do think that there there are people in 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 political positions who just don't want people eating animal products and i think that's a bad thing nevertheless there was this study published not long ago that found eating more than i think one egg per day like doubled the risk of diabetes what was so sad about that study and where people need to be very skeptical when they see those headlines we should ask how did they measure egg eating in that study? And first of all, the first problem is it was just questionnaires. It was surveys. They would give someone a survey and say, what did you eat last week? And so the person has to scratch their head and they think and they try to remember what they ate. No one can ever remember perfectly. That's one problem. The second problem is what they considered egg eating. And in that particular study that made so many headlines all around the world, they counted eggs as anything that was made with eggs in it. And so that would include things like bread and cakes and cookies and crackers. Basically, every baked food is baked with eggs. And so that would count as eating eggs. And they even noted this in the study because what they found, women had the higher correlation with egg eating and diabetes. In men, it didn't have a correlation. It was only the women. And they noted that the women liked eating baked sweets like cakes, and that counted as egg eating. Well, that is bad science because they could just as easily have said it's the sugar in the cake and it's not the eggs at all. But it's almost as if they go to that kind of study and they already know what they want the outcome to be. And generally, and, and truly, people ought to be very skeptical because of this. It almost always is an attempt to point the finger at how bad animal products are and trying to ignore the fact that humans are literally built to eat animal products. We, we are built for it and we should eat them. Thank you so much, Ben. Ben, can you yeah. explain why fasting cause troubles to some people yeah some fasting isn't easy and i think nowadays it's harder for many people because they are almost addicted to feeling full it's not so that would be one problem and this is a very real um phenomenon it's a very real addiction so it's not that the person has an addiction to any one particular food although that can happen but it's rather that they become addicted to just feeling full in their belly and they 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 when the belly starts to get empty and they feel it rumbling they panic it's it's something it's very uncomfortable and and they 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 need to fill their belly back up to, to avoid that discomfort. That would be one problem. A second problem could be the way the brain is getting energy. Because most people have elevated insulin and elevated glucose, the brain is only ever burning glucose as its fuel. Even though the brain is a hybrid engine and it can burn ketones very, very well and very happily. And in fact, that was another aspect of my study. We found that 
what, where the Alzheimer's brains don't use glucose well, they use ketones perfectly well. But nevertheless, that's that's a tangent. So if the brain is only ever used to burning glucose, partly because there's no ketones around, then when someone has this big peak of glucose, and then the glucose drops quickly, which it often does after a starchy, sugary meal, the brain senses this drop in energy because it's thinking, whoa, whoa, my only one fuel is now going away very, very quickly. I need the person to eat again very quickly. And so even though they only ate two hours ago, they, they have no reason to feel hungry. The brain is sensing this drop in glucose, and it's thinking, we need to bump this back up. And so when someone enters a fast, if the brain is only relying on glucose as a fuel, it may start to work against us. It may start to think we need to eat, don't fast, even though the body has plenty of energy. It's just that the brain isn't accustomed or doesn't have access to burning ketones as an alternative fuel. Thank you, Ben. Ben, many people think that animal proteins rise as mTOR and they avoid animal protein. <laughs> what do you say about that? Yeah, I say that's crazy. So people are afraid of mTOR because of the little bit of evidence in animals and insects that mTOR will result in aging and cancer. It will make the body age faster. And so they find that if they can turn down mTOR in these animals and insects, then the animals and insects will live longer. That's very compelling evidence. Um, so it does suggest that you don't want mTOR to be turned on too much for too long. However, there's of course no evidence in humans, but we can suppose um, that the same thing probably applies to humans. Of course, we just can't do studies long enough to see how long humans live. It's just impossible to do. So we'll never be able to confirm that. But it probably happens. I would say to live a longer life, you do want mTOR turned down um, more often than it's turned up. Now, that has led to some people, as you note, saying, well, because animal protein activates mTOR so well, we shouldn't eat it because protein is activating mTOR and then that's going to kill us. That is just silly. In fact, a study in humans found that after between the ages of like 45 to 65, they found that the group eating um, the most meat and most protein did have a higher mortality. So there was something happening there. But after the age of 65, the group eating the highest protein lived the longest. That to me suggests that whatever happened during 45 to 65, that's an anomaly. And who knows, it's all just a correlational study anyway. But the fact that the older we got, the, 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 the earlier you died if you ate the least amount of protein, that's a problem that directly challenges the, the paradigm or the theory that protein is going to spike mTOR enough to result in early death. Now, however, let's take one step back so I don't think animal protein should be looked at as a culprit. If mTOR actually matters for the sake of longevity, and that if mTOR is too high too much, you'll die sooner, or in contrast, if mTOR is lower more often, you'll live longer, all the more reason to look at insulin. Because as much as protein and amino acids can activate mTOR, insulin activates it even more. So, and you think about it, people aren't eating protein all the time. We eat protein, our amino acids in the blood go up, mTOR is activated, and then the amino acids go down and mTOR goes down. However, there are people who are keeping insulin elevated all the time. And insulin activates mTOR more than even the most anabolic of the amino acids. So rather than fear protein, if you appreciate the role of mTOR in aging, fear insulin being chronically elevated and then adjust your diet accordingly not to fear the protein or avoid the protein but to avoid the insulin spiking refined carbohydrates thank you ben ben then if we mix carbohydrates with protein then that would be worst combination yeah yeah so the worst combination is a uh, protein uh, carbohydrates and fat that combination is not ideal just for for insulin resistance and obesity and disease but Yes, if you are looking at mTOR, putting carbohydrate and protein together will have the biggest effect on mTOR. However, uh, some people may think, well, mTOR is necessary for muscle building. 
And so maybe that will help my muscles get bigger. That doesn't happen. So when you have protein with glucose or carbohydrate, you don't get any bigger muscle building effect from just protein alone. However, when you have fat and protein together, it will build muscle bigger than the protein alone. So there's that misconception where people are exercising and they think, well, now I need my protein and I'm going to mix in some carbohydrate in order to get a bigger insulin and mTOR effect. Nope, it doesn't work for muscle building. You want to put the fat in there instead. That will actually help the muscle build better than the protein alone. That's so interesting, man. Thank you. Then what is the relation between insulin and PCOS? Can we mm -hmm. reverse PCOS? Oh, for sure. Yes, yes. So PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, is the most common form of infertility in women, certainly in the U.S., and I'm very, very certain it's the same in India as well. It's, so it's the most common form of female infertility. It is a metabolic problem. So what's so interesting in the ovaries, well, and, and testes, so all estrogens in the body, the prototypical female sex hormones, all estrogens were once testosterone which is the prototypical male sex hormone. Even though women and men have both testosterone, androgens, which is testosterone and other hormones, and estrogens. Both sexes have them. Um, it's just that women have relatively more estrogens and fewer androgens than men do. Men have relatively more androgens and fewer estrogens. This is mostly because of what the ovaries are doing in a woman. A woman's ovaries has high levels of an enzyme called aromatase. And aromatase will convert the androgens, like testosterone, into the estrogens. And during the menstrual cycle or the follicular cycle, uh, in order for the woman to have uh, an ovary that releases an egg, which is the actual act of ovulation, which she needs to, to get pregnant, she must have a big spike in estrogens. That allows, that basically signals to the ovaries that it's okay to let one of the eggs out. However, when a woman has elevated insulin, insulin turns that enzyme aromatase off. It turns it down. And so now the ovaries are trying to convert testosterone into estrogens, but it can't. And so in contrast, the woman ends up producing too few estrogens and she does not ovulate. So there's no egg that comes out. And now the ovaries are releasing too many androgens like testosterone. And so she ends up not only not ovulating, but she also now has some uncomfortable physical changes too. Like maybe she starts to get hair on her face. Maybe she starts to lose hair on top or gets acne on her face. All of those are problems associated with too much testosterone. And at the core of the problem, it's because the chronically elevated insulin is not allowing the ovaries to produce sex hormones in the right ratios. Thank you so much, Ben. Ben, can you talk about plagues of prosperity? Yes, yes. So that's a term that I like to use because one, I like the way it sounds, but also it's, I think it helps us understand these diseases of civilization. That's another way of describing these. So these plagues of prosperity or these diseases of civilization are the problems that are, I refer to that are killing us now, but two generations or three generations ago, our ancestors would have had no idea or would have had very little concern. So it's these problems that are killing us now that our ancestors didn't deal with. Our ancestors would have died from something like an infection or an accident, hunting or something like that. Now we die from these, these diseases of civilization, things like heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, fatty liver disease, even most forms of cancer. These are problems that were once unheard of. And they all have very different disease. The, the, the diseases themselves are very different. For example, polycystic ovary syndrome is, is not the same problem as Alzheimer's disease, and neither of those are the same problem as hypertension. But all of these diseases that are killing us, the plagues of prosperity, or making us uncomfortable, like the infertilities, they do have one thing in common. Even though they will have numerous differences, to varying degrees, each of them is caused by insulin resistance. And that's why I wanted to write the book, Why We Get Sick, because I thought if we need to change the way we look at chronic disease and 
so I could imagine someone who opens up their medicine cabinet, their, their cupboard in their kitchen where they have their medicines and vitamins and everything, and they have to take a medication for their diabetes. They have to take a medication for their blood pressure. They have to take a medication for their infertility, even in men, like erectile dysfunction. That is very connected to insulin resistance. So they have all three of these different medications, and they think that they need each of them because each of these diseases is so separate. But... I would hope that they learn that each of these disorders is uh, a manifestation of one common problem, namely insulin resistance. And when we, when we can acknowledge that these seemingly disparate problems have one common core, well, then we don't have to address each of these problems. It's like a tree, and we're constantly trying to prune the branches only for the, grand, the branches to grow back. And that's all a medication can do. It just is attempting to cut branches off that always grow back. Rather than continuing to trim at the branches, we go right to the trunk of the tree and we just cut the tree down. That is the, this tree of disease, these plagues of prosperity. That is what addressing diet can do to insulin resistance. So when we acknowledge that insulin resistance is a common root problem of most chronic diseases, then we can further go and acknowledge that lifestyle changes, diet changes, are the best way to improve the problem. That there, there certainly are drugs that can improve insulin resistance, but they don't work nearly as well as even modest lifestyle changes. So my hope is that someone's listening to us talk about this, they may be even thinking about their own health problems or their own medications, realize that diabetes and infertility and, and hypertension, those are, are not diseases that are a result of lacking a medication. It's not a problem that the person didn't have that medication. And so the medication can't solve it. It can only address the symptoms of the actual problem. And very often that actual problem is insulin resistance. And again, as I said, once we, once we acknowledge insulin resistance at the heart of these problems, we then can change diet and eliminate the problem completely. So you'd asked about reversing PCOS. There is, in fact, a study to show that it, you can reverse PCOS um, by adopting a low-carbohydrate diet. You can, you can eliminate type 2 diabetes, a disease that many say is incurable. You can absolutely cure it with no evidence of it existing through dietary changes. And, and not ever having to use medications. And the same goes for hypertension and fatty liver disease and many more problems. These are diet problems. And so the food we eat is either the culprit or the cure. It's either causing the problem or it's curing the problem, depending on what we put in our mouths. It's all up to us. Thank you so much, Ben. Ben, uh, we have questions from subscribers. Mm -hmm. First question is how to eat to fight insulin resistance, is it possible mm -hmm. to reverse type 2 diabetes with a low-carb diet? Very, very, yes, very, absolutely. In fact, there was a, a study published by my friend Jason Fung, who is a fasting expert. He found that they could take people with type 2 diabetes and just have them start fasting, and they could cut their diabetes gone. They got off all medications in just weeks. We published a paper where we took 11 women with type 2 diabetes and had them adopt a low-carbohydrate diet for 90 days. And after just 90 days, the insulin resistance was gone. There was no evidence of type 2 diabetes at all. And so they never had to take any medications. So I would say this is something that can be reversed in as little as just a few weeks um, if the person is very serious about changing diet. And I would say it's just those dietary recommendations I made earlier control carbohydrates, prioritize protein, don't fear fat, and fast. Thank you, Ben. Ben, next question is, I have heard that PUFAS from vegetable oils causes insulin resistance more than carbohydrates. If it's true, mm. then, then can we eat more carbohydrates by lowering vegetable oils? Yes. So uh, I know that there are people who say that, um, but there's no evidence to support that idea. Now, people will... Um, my main contention is that chronically elevated insulin itself will start to drive insulin resistance. So I believe there are three primary causes of insulin resistance. And when I say primary, I, I mean to say that this is evidence that has been shown in cell cultures, so isolated cells in a laboratory setting, 
It has been shown in laboratory animals like mice and rats and in humans. So all three of these biomedical models going kind of from worst to best. So the three primary causes of insulin resistance is one, inflammation. Inflammation will cause insulin resistance in all of these, in cells, animals, and humans. St uh, stress, like the, the prototypical stress hormones like cortisol and epinephrine, those will cause insulin resistance in cells, rodents, and humans. And lastly, elevated insulin. Too much insulin causes insulin resistance. And this has been shown in cells, rodents, and animals, uh, cells, uh, animals, and humans. And this is why I am such an advocate of controlling carbohydrates because it's a good way to keep insulin low. So I look at that one. Now, seed oils also likely cause insulin resistance, but it's not a primary cause. You don't have evidence across all three layers like I just mentioned. However, vegetable oils do all kinds of problems. One problem is that they make fat cells fatter. So when you have fat cells that are accumulating the fats from vegetable oils, then they have to grow through a process called hypertrophy. And that's when each individual fat cell is getting really big. And rather than a cell getting a little big and then it makes a new cell to help or a new cell to help. So the cells never get too big. With too much seed oils, the fat cells get big through hypertrophy. And a very fat fat cell becomes insulin resistant and inflamed, in increasing inflammation. And that will then promote inf uh, insulin resistance throughout the body. So the people that will say carbohydrates aren't the problem, they will look at studies of people um, in ad adhering to traditional diets and they will say well these people will eat um, carbohydrates like from from vegetables from from tuberous vegetables but they and so that can't be carbohydrates that's causing the problem and and they're not eating any um, seed oils so it must be that the seed oils aren't but also um, so it must be that the seed oils are what's causing the problem because that's what's changed from the typical hunter-gatherer diet to now. Well, that's a very silly paradigm because I could just as readily say, well, yeah, but they're not eating refined carbohydrates. They're not eating these, these breads and cereals and, and sugary foods because they, they aren't. But also they have exquisitely low insulin. And that's my primary contention. It's that chronically elevated insulin is causing the insulin resistance. And so the best way to address that is by cutting back on refined carbohydrates. So people that are saying insulin resistance is a result of seed oils, they don't have any evidence to support that. They're reading between the lines by looking at these more hunter-gatherer societies and saying, well, they don't need any vegetable oils, so that's why they don't have insulin resistance. Whereas I could say, yeah, but they have very low insulin because the carbohydrates that they are eating are so unrefined in whole food that it's not spiking their insulin very often. So there's no way to use those old studies as evidence in favor or against carbohydrates or, or um, seed oils because the model just doesn't quite hold up, I, I believe. Because I think it's very important in India where you have a lot of people that may be cooking with seed oils you know, that might be primary one of one of them, not it would be the only because I know ghee is big and I'm a very big fan of ghee. But even where people may not be using ghee and they have that bottle of vegetable oil and then they're making say they're, they're making the non or the uh, in the in that seed oil. That to me is the absolute worst of all. That's a perfect storm where you now have refined carbohydrates with these refined oils. And that's not just a problem in India, of course. In the U.S. and anywhere else, almost every packaged food that has carbohydrates. So if you're eating carbohydrates from a bag or a box, then almost always the fat is going to be from something like soybean oil or another vegetable oil. And then in India, I think the problem just persists because even though you may have a home where you have a mother or a grandmother who's doing lots of the baking, you know, you're not getting your food from store-bought packaged foods you're making it at home and I would say that's a good thing to make food at home but they're using so much vegetable oil as the fat that you're cooking the carbohydrates in or even the anything else that's not good that's not good so in India I worry that we have very high seed oil perhaps because of a fear of animal fats or, or, or not a fear just a, a restriction 
you know, religious or otherwise, they don't want to eat any animal foods, including animal fats. But I strongly contend animal fats are much, much better than vegetable oils. Thank you, Ben. Another question is, if low-fat diets are bad, then why does it help others sometimes to treat insulin resistance? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. I would say any change that someone makes from the typical Indian or American diet is going to be a good change any change and so if someone goes from the typical diet which is high carbohydrate and high fat the way it is nowadays and they just say well I'm gonna push the fat down the good thing and just focus on carbohydrates if you're cutting fat that means you have to be cutting processed foods because most processed foods are high in both and so when people go low fat they typically will go kind of plant-based or whole food and I would say that's a wonderful improvement over the typical diet. However, to go one step further, we then say, well, what happens in the clinical studies, which have been done? When you take people and split them up onto two diets, one diet is the typical low fat, high carbohydrate. The other diet is the inverse where it's low carbohydrate, high fat. That low carbohydrate, high fat diet always will result in better improvements in insulin resistance and glucose than the low fat diet will. So a low fat diet can be better compared to the normal diet, the typical Western diet or Indian as well, everywhere, the global diet. However, that's not the question we should ask. It should be which of the two when competed head to head is better and outperforms the other. And that will be the low carbohydrate diet. Thank you, Ben. Ben, uh, last question from subscribers. Mm -hmm. Can we prevent ourselves from diabetes if our parents are suffering from it? Ah, that will mean you have to work harder. No doubt about it. Type 2 diabetes is very, has a very strong genetic component. So these will be the people who will tend to, even as they start to get a little fat, they start to become insulin resistant and type 2 diabetic. It does not take very much to have a very low threshold of how much the body, how far the body can go before it becomes type 2 diabetes. So if they have parents with type 2 diabetes, that is a person who has to be very careful. And I would say, unfortunately, they need to be even more careful than average when it comes to carbohydrates. Because type 2 diabetes is when you eat carbohydrates and you, you, the glucose stays very high for very, very long. Even though there's lots of insulin, it's just the insulin isn't working there. Very insulin resistant. And so the way to help that glucose come down and the insulin come down is to avoid the macronutrient that spikes insulin the most, which is carbohydrates. So yes, if someone has first degree relatives like parents that have type 2 diabetes, you certainly can avoid it absolutely you just have to fight a little harder than someone else might have to thank you ben ben last question would you like to issue a seven day challenge to our subscribers anything any type yeah 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 of course I, that what a great question um an opportunity i would say this change change the eating window change the eating window and i will say two things on both ends of the eating window within a day Change breakfast tomorrow and don't eat a breakfast that is based on carbohydrates because overnight, as someone's been, you've been sleeping, insulin has come down so the body can become a little more insulin sensitive and the body can go into fat burning because when insulin's down, sugar burning is turned off and fat burning is turned up. Don't stop that so quickly by eating a breakfast that is high in carbohydrates especially refined carbohydrates like flours and sugars because then you turn off fat burning you turn off the insulin sensitizing benefits of low insulin because you spike the insulin and the glucose and typically if you start your day with a big glucose and insulin spike you will be hungrier and seeking more carbohydrates for the entire day so for seven days change breakfast every day and either fast through breakfast or focus on protein and fat and then the second part of this is after you eat dinner maybe 7 p.m. at the latest hopefully stop eating don't eat anymore after you eat dinner you will sleep so much better 
and you will help insulin come down sooner even if you have carbohydrates for dinner which I sometimes do because for me my rule is I'm very good with my breakfast and my lunch but I eat dinner with my family so if we're eating foods with carbohydrates I don't care it's okay I'm eating with my family I'm sitting with my wife and my children and I don't mind but I stop eating after dinner and then I just drink water or, or carbonated or club soda or something in the evening and, and that's done so for seven days change your eating window change breakfast um, to avoid carbohydrates and focus on protein and fat or to control carbohydrates and then with dinner eat dinner that's fine but stop eating once dinner is over and help that be earlier if possible I know different cultures will eat at different times but try to not eat within about three hours or four if possible of going to bed three hours I would say at least so if you're going to bed at 10 p.m. try to eat uh, at, you know no later than around 7 p.m. If, if it's possible and if it's not possible make it possible just for seven days just seven days that's so interesting man so thank you so much Ben for coming to the show and helping us to become healthy <laughs> Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. This is something I am very, very interested, especially in India. I will never forget I, in 2018 when I had a chance to go to Raipur to give a talk about this topic. I was so happy to go to India uh, and, and to give this talk because I think maybe more than any other country, this matters to India at the moment where we have such a problem with insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes maybe a bigger problem in India than any other country in the world right now so this is a message I believe is very very important for your audience and I am truly grateful to provide some information in that regard thank you so much ben. my pleasure yes yes subscribe to BNS Goku great